So we're going to finish up the 1.3 examples. Okay, we're going to do 1.4 at 1130. Go over any quiz prep questions you have from 1.3. I emailed on Friday all the answers to all the quiz preps. The three 1.3 quiz preps that we sent, that we did. On Thursday, continue all with 1.4. And we should be, should be able to even get into maybe some 1.5. At 11.30 is your last chance to ask questions in class about 1.3 quiz preps. At 11.45 is the 1.3 K-Cone quiz. That is when I will hand them out. Not before. At 11.45 Thursday. Think of it this way. If you are taking the quiz in class, it would happen at the end of class. If you're not here to take the quiz, it's a zero. You must be in person to pick it up. I will not post it. I will not email it to you. It cannot be picked up for you. I will take roll. So if you're absent and you turned in a quiz anyway, how did you get the quiz? Well, I, I was asked, and so my ID number is, is you know, the last digit is the same as my friend. So I just photocopied my friends, and then I did that photocopy. No, you weren't here to pick it up in person. You, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying for the record right now, you can't do that. If you're not here to pick it up in person, you could always come by an office hour and pick it up. Just don't interrupt the class. You can come by any office hour, pick it up, and turn it in. Okay? You must be in person to pick it up. Okay? You have to pick it up on it. It's due Tuesday at 10 a.m. I'm going to go over what it looks like in terms of uh, rules and regulations. Okay, do a 10, and then next Tuesday, continue on getting close to finishing one, chapter one. Okay. How's that focus over there? Okay. No. Yes, no. 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 So here it is. To even things out, basically, I wrote three different versions of the book. The last digit of your student ID number is blank, blank, blank. So the last digit of your student ID number. Hopefully you know your student ID number. If you don't, I can always pull it. But it's based on the last digit of your student ID. Okay, do the 24th and again. This quiz to be done by students whose last digit of student ID number is this, this, or this. You must turn in the appropriate quiz for credit. Any quiz submitted that does not correspond correctly to the assigned student will receive a zero. This has happened before. Let's just say, in trig, I gave it based on odd versus even. They accidentally thought zero was an odd number. So they picked up 
Okay. The odd quits in their last digit of zero. They did the wrong quits. They got the same. They're in traditional zeros even. It's even because it's divisible by two, zero divided by two is zero. Or they could have asked. You do the wrong quiz, it's a zero. Okay. And it's going to be very clear out the, or uh, clean cut because it's going to be exactly what number, what number. <clears throat> uh, this quiz is due Tuesday, 9-24-24, 10 a.m. If it is late, so it's all spelled out. If it's late, that would be between 10 and 10 30. And when I say 10 and 10 30, I'm going to collect the quizzes as close to 10 o'clock, as close to after 10 o'clock as, as I can. So clock strikes 10, I'm going to go down past the quiz in and collect them. And as soon as I collect them, anything after that will be late. I'm going to take off two points. Now, why two points? The, the bottom line is, and I'm always, if it's late, when you're late, late, it's 10, minus 10% of the raw score. The raw score, 24 points. 10% is 2.4. I'm always going to round down. So 2.4 rounded down is two. We take out two points. The trade quiz was 84 points. Late, round down, it was eight points on. Okay. So two points to play. If you have not turned in your quiz by 10.30, it's just not going to take. Okay. Business that will not be accepted after Tuesday. No, it's like I have to like do, I'm filling out some kind of leave. Make sure it's And then read, follow directions, simplify, reduce answers to lowest terms. Lowest terms, simplify, reduce to lowest terms. But it's going to, nothing's going to be a decimal on this quiz. No decimal. Write your final solution in the given space when provided. Just like you see in the in the with preps, uh, you have to show appropriate work to receive full credit. If you want some advice, watch today's co rec. I did examples of every version of the quiz you're going to be asked to do. I did examples of all three different kinds of quizzes. Okay. Basically, all three, all three of the quiz preps, you're going to get a quiz that represents your quiz might be second quiz prep or it might be from the first quiz prep. That would be your function. So today we did examples of all three paths. So today's uh, pro rec would be a really good video if you're doing your quiz. A take home, a take home quiz. You have a quiz anyway. It's open note. Open whatever you want to have open, just don't internet device. On a take home, I have no clue what you're doing, but you still have to show the work. So, the video that we did today would be a really good example of how of what I'm going to expect when you're going to put it. Work must be, I expect pristine work. It's a take home. Okay, if I can't read it, I'm not even going to try to guess. It's just going to be. I can't read this wrong, right? Or let's just put it this way. If it looks like a seven, but I can't really tell, then I'm going to guess it's a two. Because I have no clue. Because you didn't bother thinking it was that important that I could read your hand. Okay? I got a hundred, well, not a hundred, about 90 of you three H students. So if you want to pack the next day, I can still take some time to get it done. Make it, make it easy. Make it, make it easy for me. I try to make things easier. So we need no scratch paper. Do not turn scratch paper in, please. I'm not going to grade stuff on scratch paper. Do you work in little boxes? Now, you can work the problem out on scratch paper before you actually put it on your quiz. That way, you know, okay, I'm working this problem out. Okay, and instead of messing up the quiz before you turn it in. Wouldn't that be wonderful uh, for my sense? Yeah, I keep thinking about myself. 
I love the pencil. To be done in pencil, not a bad idea. And a deep pencil. So that's basically the direction you can see what's up here. Okay. Any questions? So again, those will be handed out on Thursday at 11 45. Okay. And that's at 11.30 today. You get to ask questions right here. There's quiz prep one, here, and then quiz prep two, and quiz prep three, and there are corresponding answers. Quiz prep one, two, and three. Yes. I didn't get the uh, 1.2. I didn't, I never posted it as just questions, but I posted the quiz prep two with its answers. So quiz prep two was posted with its answers, and I posted all three of them with answers on Friday in the announcement. Okay. But yeah, that was an oops on mine. I never posted the quiz prep two. We did it in class last Thursday. Okay, that's how we handled quiz prep two. We did it in class. Before we do number 37, we're going to do three and five. Okay. One more time. Let's see where you remember it. Every set of ordered pairs is considered a a relation. A relation. R, yes, got an R in it. Every set of ordered pairs, all sets of ordered pairs, sets of ordered pairs, X and Y, are related. There's a relation between the X and the Y value. Some kind of relation. Okay. Those people you spend, you know, some summer vacation 20 years ago or 10 years ago, five years ago with, they're related to you. Okay, there's a relation. Special relations are functions if X does not repeat. X cannot repeat. For every X, there's only one Y. Y can repeat as many times as one. But you can have one X for every Y, or one X can only have one Y associated with it. So question three is saying, can this order pair three zero and this order pair three five? Can this these two order pairs represent a function? No. Because the X coordinate happens twice with two different Ys. If I plug in three, we get a zero. But later on, we plug in three, we get a five. That's why it's not a function. When we plug in three, we want one answer for the y value only. So it's a relation, but it's not a function. It's not a function. Okay. And then question five. Does the domain of the function f of x equals one plus x Square root one plus x. Does the domain include, in other words, can x equal a negative two? So check it. F of negative two. Is this okay? Is the square root of one plus a negative two? Is the square root of one minus two okay to do? No. No. Because what's one minus two? Negative one, and you can't take the square root of negative number because a square root of a negative is not a real number. So does the domain include negative two? The answer is no, it's not in the domain. The domain are the X's that we're allowed to use in the function. 
what can I plug into this function? Only values of x that don't cause negatives in here. Okay. And we'll cover more questions about domains when we get to the other form box. So that's all you had to do with fives. Am I allowed to plug in negative? Yes, no. And then 37. Q of X is equal to one over X squared minus nine. And we want to plug in Q of negative three. So Q of negative three is equal to one over Replace x with a negative 3. Because you're replacing it with a negative, parentheses are always advisable. Negative 3, you're going to square it. And then minus 9. So q of negative 3 is equal to 1 over. What happens when I square this negative 3? We get a positive 9 minus 9. So q of negative 3 is equal to? 1 over 0, which is 10 to 5. And divide by 0. So you don't leave it as 1 over 0. We write the words on the bottom. Then Q of 2. So now we plug 2 into the function. Replace X with 2. So Q of 2 is equal to 1 over X squared minus 9. So that's 1 over parentheses. Doesn't hurt. 2 squared minus 9. So Q of 2 is equal to 1 over 4 minus 9. That's okay. Q of 2 is equal to 1 over 4 minus 9. Negative 5. Negative 5. So on your quiz, there's the question. There's your work. At the bottom of the box is this. Q of 2, write your final answer at the bottom of the box so I can find it easily if I can't do it. I don't mind if you write 1 over negative 5. That's your final answer. But remember, it's exactly the same as just negative 1 over 5, which is exactly the same as negative 1 over 5. So as long as it's 1 negative, the whole thing's negative. Does it matter if you leave 1 negative in the denominator, out in front, in the numerator, just 1 negative? Q of y plus three. Y plus three. We're going to replace X with y plus three. So this X is going to get replaced with a y plus three, which means this X has to get replaced with a y plus three. So when you make the substitution, this is what I really hope and expect to see. Show me the substitution. Whether it's plugging in a number, show the substitution. Here's Q of negative 3. So this is what it looks like when I replace X with a negative 3. Not the answer, just show the substitution. This is how you make good habits. Because when you really need it, Q of y plus 3 equals 1 over, so instead of an x squared, it's going to be parentheses y plus 3 squared and then a minus 9. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Did you just do the substitution? Did you just replace x with whatever you're supposed to replace with? 
Did you use parentheses? Now we got to simplify. Order of operations inside the parentheses first. There's nothing we can do. So then we have to do this exponent. So Q of Y plus three is equal to one over. Now, I went through different ways of how to multiply this out last week. And I went over it again in detail in the correct this morning. I will show you again if you ask, but we're closing in on not so many more times unless you need to see if you're not about. Y plus three squared is Y squared plus six Y plus nine. And then you have a minus nine zero. Kind of like the only way I can force you to figure it out is to stop showing it to you. When I give you, the, is there a shortcut? Because I do the the other way you saw this first, where you write y plus three parentheses and y plus three parentheses, and then you write the total. Well, that would be the special product when you have a plus b and you square it. Is the first term a squared? In the middle, you multiply the a and b together, but there's double in the middle, two of them, two times the ab. So in the middle, first one, I square the y, then I multiply y times three, and I double y times three is three y, and two of them is six y, two times three y, six y. And then plus b squared. So plus three squared is my plus sign. Okay. Now, if you have subtraction, it's exactly the same terms, except in the middle, it's minus two a. So technically, you could put these two together in one. A plus or minus B squared would equal the first term gets squared. In the middle, you have a 2AB. If it's addition, we add the 2AB. When it's subtraction, we subtract the 2AB. A plus B, A squared plus 2AB. A minus B, A squared minus 2AB. And it's always plus B squared at the end. Actually, I can write it with one. Special product. And how we get that special product is we do A plus B times A plus B. That's how we get that in the first place. And we distribute. That's how we know it works no matter what we do. We don't make it up. It comes from something. So if you're if you're not seeing this. Then what you need to do is one over this is parentheses y plus three times y plus three. And then you don't forget you have that minus nine. So we have one over y times y is y to the second. Y times positive three is a positive three Y. Three times Y is another positive three Y. Three times three is a positive nine. And then you still have that minus sign. Which is where I'm at right here. Because now, if I'm gonna keep going here, one over y squared, three y plus three y is six y, nine minus nine cancel out. So that's the final answer. And over here is one over y squared plus six y, nine minus nine makes a zero.
substitute, simplify. Once you substitute, it's order of operations. But you gotta know how to foil things out, you gotta know how to combine like terms. But you can't get to that the order of operations combined like terms unless you actually just substitute it first. So once you get to this part correct, from here to just writing it like this so you know what's next. Take it one step at a time. Fifty-eight. Find the domain. Find the domain of the function. So, your quiz, your take-home quiz Wednesday, you got to find the domain. Write your answer to the interval location. Okay. Fifty-eight. Now, g of x equals 1 minus 2x squared. And then we're doing 63. g of x here is... One over x minus three over x plus two. So when you're asked the domain questions, it's almost like I really wish they would just ask me to solve them. You know, just tell me what, what am I supposed to solve? It's more easy, it's easier just. Solve for x. In a roundabout way, they are asking you that question. They're not saying it. You actually have to interpret what they want from you. Domain. Domain is what we plug into a function. Bottom line, the domain for all functions, all real numbers, unless something bad might happen. So you have to determine whether or not the potential of something bad might happen. For right now, there's only two bad things that might go on. And this is what I posted last week. There you go. There you go. Bad for domain. A number over zero. Is there a possibility that the denominator of the function could equal zero. If yes, the domain is everything except that value or values. Or, bad for domain, an even root of a negative number. A square root, fourth root, sixth root, eighth root, an even root of a negative. Is there a possibility that the radicand, the inner part of a radicand, of an even root could be negative. You can't get the square root of a negative. If yes, you let the radicand, let the inside 
be greater than or equal to zero, and you solve it. The domain is that answer. The domain is what is going to make it positive or zero. So that's what you do. Is there a potential for a square root of the negative? Do we even have a square root? No. So there's no way we're going to get a square root of a negative if this function doesn't even have a square root in the first place. So there's no way square root of a negative is going to happen. Is there any way we're going to get zero in the denominator? No, because it doesn't even have a denominator in the first place. There's no way to get zero in the denominator if it doesn't have a fraction. So that means nothing bad can happen in this function. So that means what, what works, all real numbers. The domain of this function, all real numbers. Now, just quick flip side. If it was 2x squared over 3, because now there's a fraction. The domain is the x's. When I plug in things for x, is it changing this 3 down here? Is it changing the denominator ever? No. So when I plug in x's, it's not going to change the denominator. It's never going to make the denominator zero. So the domain is still all real numbers. It's only if you have an x in a denominator when you have to be concerned. <clears throat> That's when the potential for something bad can happen. That's why 63 is up. So yeah. But this one... The domain is all real numbers. So this is how you use, or you might have written it in the past. The domain is all real numbers. But the directions are going to say, write your answer using interval notation. A picture looks like this. Picture being a graph on a number line. You shade all of the real numbers means you would shade everything to the left and to the right. Everything gets shaded. That's not interval notation. Interval notation means everything from parentheses, negative infinity, to infinity, parentheses. That's the interval of x's that we can plug into this function. This is the interval notation. What values of x are allowed to be plugged into that function? Everything from negative infinity to infinity. That's what all real numbers look like. That's an interval. It's always parentheses on infinity. Parentheses means you cannot equal that value. You cannot get to it. So this is the interval location. Six degree. G of x is equal to 1 over x minus 3 over x plus 2. We're going to find the domain. Well, now we have possibility of 0 and a denominator. So we have want to find out what might make the denominator equal to 0. So you take this denominator and you let it equal to 0. And so, oh, sorry, so that's good. If I plug in 0, I get one over zero right off the bat. So that means the domain cannot have zero in it. I cannot plug zero into this function. Zero is okay right here, but I can't use zero in the first fraction. I get under five. So I'm not allowed to use zero. But what about this one? X plus two cannot be zero as well. So that means X cannot be what? 
negative two would make a zero. So X better not equal negative two. There are two numbers that are out of the domain. In other words, the domain is who's invited to the party of the function. Who's going to come into the party? Who's allowed? All real numbers get to come to this party. Nobody's excluded. Everybody gets it. But over here, we have a couple of trouble troublemakers. If zero goes into the party, the whole thing's undefined. So zero can't come to the party. And if negative two tries to get into this party, this one's undefined. So negative two can't be in the domain. Negative two's kicked out. So the domain is everything except these two numbers. So it's a picture. And again, the visual just helps me. There's an open circle on the zero. There's an open circle on the negative two. Everything else works. Everything to the left of negative two is allowed. Everything in between negative two and zero works. And everything to the right of zero works. That's a picture of the domain. Now you have to do interval notation. So the interval over here, it goes from negative infinity, parenthesis, negative infinity, and it goes all the way up to negative two. But it doesn't equal negative two, so it's a parenthesis. Join together. Union. When you join something together, it's a union. This set join together a union with the next interval. The next interval is everything between negative two and zero. So it starts at negative two, but it doesn't equal. So it's a parentheses. Everything from this negative two all the way up to zero, but it doesn't equal zero. Parentheses. So everything from negative infinity up to two, but not equal to two. Everything between negative two and zero, but not equal to negative two or zero. Join together with everything from zero to infinity. When we want the domain, we don't want you to tell us what's not allowed. When you give the domain, you're supposed to tell us what is allowed. So saying everything except zero and negative two, you're telling me what's not allowed. We want you to actually be able to describe what is allowed. Everything from negative infinity to negative two, union, negative two and zero, union, zero to infinity. That's what is allowed. Math is a language. Any further, you got to learn how to speak. That's how we speak. That's how we write. Okay. I'm not going to ask you what it's able to write out like this. Never as a mandatory test question. That could be a bonus question because, oh, you know, fluffy kittens and happy dogs are off on that. Last example, three, four, eight, and six. Again, top and bonus. This little symbol right here next to the directions. When you see that symbol next to a problem or next to directions, 
that means it's a calculus type of question. This is a problem that we would prep calculus for. This is called a difference quotient. Difference, we're doing subtraction. Quotient, we have a division. So you pick 84 over 8 of 6. So 84, G of X is 3X minus 1. G of X is 3X minus 1. You're supposed to evaluate, find the difference quotient and simplify the answer. We want to evaluate g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. Provided h does not equal zero. And yeah, this, I like this one with the, the bonus side. Here's why G, why H is not equal to zero. Yeah, we don't want to divide by zero, but look what happens if you put zero, uh, zero in for H. If you let, just aside, H equals zero, we get G of X plus zero, Minus, minus g of x all over this h is a zero. What's x plus zero? x plus zero. It's just x. So this would be g of x minus g of x, and the denominator is a zero. What would g of x minus itself be? I end up with zero, zero, which is, it's not undefined. It's not zero. Remember, we talked about this. It's indeterminate. It's indeterminate. That's what takes us to that calculus level. This is slope. This is y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. Technically. It's slope at one point. So if you plug in a distance of zero between the two points you get on the bottom are indeterminate. We don't know what it means. So that's why we can't let H equal zero. So what is it in terms of just H? C. It starts with just substitute. Just substitute. What does it look like by just substitute? Then I'll simplify First thing you're supposed to do is replace this x with an x plus h. That means this x is an x plus h. So g of x plus h, whatever goes in three times, that x plus h and then you have a minus one. So here's my g of x plus h minus g of x. g of x, g of x is 3x minus 1. That's what g of x is. g of x with just x. What does this thing look like if it's just an x? It's 3x minus 1, all over h. Now, what I just wrote is wrong. 
I purposely wrote it up here to see if you can figure out what have I done that's going to make it not well. The, the eggs need a frequency and not the three. No. G of X plus H, so X plus H, X plus H, so three of X plus H, X plus H goes here three times that X plus H, and then there's a minus one after it, minus G of X, minus G of X. What do I keep whining and crying and bitching about? Parentheses. Where would I need parentheses? Where? Right there. Because if I, I'm subtracting all of D of X, Minus G of X. If I just do this, I'm not subtracting the whole thing. Because the whole thing is not being subtracted unless there's a parenthesis around the whole thing. Watch. Let's say we have a 10. Okay? And let's say we have a 10 and we're going to subtract, let's say a negative, a negative 12. What's 10 minus negative 12? That becomes what? 10 plus 12, right? And what's 10 plus 12? 22. All right. Negative 12, agree or disagree? Negative 12 is the same as negative 6 minus 6. Okay. So what if I go, all right, 10 minus, okay? Oh, wait. I want to do this way. Um, negative 12 is the same as 8 minus 20, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So 10 minus negative 12. So 10 minus 8 minus 20. Ten minus negative twelve, and I'm going to replace my negative twelve with an eight minus twenty, but not put parentheses around. If I don't put parentheses around, because that's negative twelve, if I don't put parentheses around this, ten minus eight is negative is two, and then two minus twenty is negative eighteen. It's not the same answer. If I want it to be the same thing, that negative 12 would have to be a negative 12 before I can do the subtraction. It has to be in a parenthesis before I can subtract it. So if you don't put parentheses around g of x, you're going to subtract all of g of x. That means you better put parentheses, parentheses around all of g of x before you subtract it. Whenever you subtract more than one term, parentheses. I taught calculus and AP calculus at Buchanan for around 10 years. This was such an issue all the time. They wouldn't use parentheses. It's a lazy thing. And it takes supposedly calculus students that can't do algebra. Or refuse to pay attention to the details, and the details of, is what goes on. Right here, I'm trying to get that across that parentheses matter, and I've been saying that since August what, 12th, 13th. It matters because now it's just here's the substitution. What does it look like with x plus h plus 
three times dx plus h, and there's a minus one. And then minus g of x, well, there's my g of x, all over that h. Then we simplify 3x, 3 times h, 3 times h, minus 1, minus 3x, plus 1, all over h. Three x minus three x cancels out. Negative one plus one makes a zero. They cancel out. All I have left is this three h over that h. H divided by h reduces. Final answer is three. Oh, yes. A bonus of the question would be, here's a function. What is g of x plus h minus g of x all over h? But there are four, you know, you have, I think you have 83 and 85, but that's 84 as an example. So it's going simplify. Not quiz, but test. Oh. Okay. Right. Find the domain of the range. And we're doing this one just because just by looking at a picture. If we can look at a picture and decide what the domain and the range is. Domain is the what? X's. The X's. Range is the, the Y. Domain is your X's, the range is your Y. Interval notation. <laughs> this graph starts here at negative one, negative five. Starts right there. Then it goes up. All the way to this point right here, two four. And then it comes back down all the way to this open circle, which is at four zero. The range is the exit. So what X values are we using to make this graph? So we're looking at the X values and we always want to go from left to right. So what X is the graph starting with? Negative one. And the graph goes from left to right and it ends up at what X value over here? There's a Y value over here? It stops at four. The graph ends at four. So just the graph, not the not the uh, picture. Otherwise, it would have started. 
So the first x value in this picture is this x at negative one, and then it goes all the way for every x value. There's a y value, solid graph, solid graph. But when we get to four, there is an open circle there, which means there is no point when we plug in four. If there was a point, it would be a four zero. We can get infinitely close to x equals four, 3.9, 3.99, 3 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, but we cannot plug four in. Or Ford is not defined for this for this particular piece of the graph. So the domain starts, so it would be a bracket from negative one, and it goes all the way to four, and because it does not equal four, it's a parenthesis. That picture uses all the x's from negative one to four, including negative one, but not the four. Okay? Those are the x's that are being used. Okay? Oh, did it say so? The y will start throwing negative five going to zero? Well, that's it. The range, range of the y values, it does start at this y value of negative five. Now, if you say from negative five to zero, that means it's only going to go up this high. We're only going to get those y values. It's going to go higher than zero. So the range goes all the way up to what y value? It goes all the way up to four. And then, yeah, these repeat, but that's okay. So the y values that actually are coming out of this graph go from a negative 5, and it equals negative 5, all the way up to a y value that's a 4, and that's a solid point, and it equals the 4. Now, when it comes back down, it doesn't equal the 0 here. But you know what? It did equal 0 over there. So did 0 come out as a range up? Yeah, it did. Okay. So zero is included in the range because it does have a solid point right here. Zero came out of a range value. Zero or four was never coming out as a domain value. So that's how we would write the domain and the range based upon the diagram. Okay. So, you never repeat the numbers in the Y's? I mean, when you're writing the parentheses, you never have that's kind of a question. Well, let's say I have a list of order pairs. And we're doing, let's say, I've got uh, three, seven, I've got four, eight, I've got uh, negative two, five, I've got. Uh, Negative three eight, and one more. Let's go with uh, zero seven. So the domain. Let's see. We have negative three, negative two, zero, three, and a four. So I'm just listing the x's. The smallest x is negative three, then negative two, then zero, and then three four. Those are all my x's. One, two, three, four, five ordered pairs. One, two, three, four, five different x. The range, I would just list the y values. Now, I have a five. Then I have a seven. Then I have an eight. I already wrote down seven and eight, so I don't need to write twice. Okay, sorry. So, and that's, no, that's fine. Domain and range. Domain what are the sets of values? What numbers can I plug into this function? So what am I allowed to use? Do whatever it is we list. Range. What y's would come out? Just because a y happens twice, once I say it once, what y comes out, 12 does. I don't I don't care how many times 12 happens. I care about the fact 12 happened. 
So here's a good example of finding the domain and the range of a radical square root. So let's find the domain. Well, let me get this right here and open Bad for domain, square roots of negatives. Is there a possibility the Vatican could be negative? Then you make it greater than or equal to zero and so on. So f of x is square root x minus four. So there's a chance we might get the square root of a negative. So you take the radican, the inside, x minus four cannot be negative. Well, that's kind of hard to write as a math equation. So if it can't be negative, it has to be positive. Positive means greater than zero, but if it can't be negative, it could also equal zero. When I first started teaching calculus, the, the language in the book would always say the words non-negative. So whenever we get out these definitions, like can be non-negative, non-negative. Students say, well, why do they just say positive? Well, non-negative includes the fact that it could be zero. Because if we just said positive, positive doesn't include zero. When you say non-negative, it includes zero and positive. Language matters. So x minus 4 has to be non-negative. That means greater than or equal to zero. If we solve, all you have to do is add 4. So the x's that are allowed have to be greater than or equal to 4. A picture would look like this. It'd be a closed circle because 4 works on the 4. And greater than would be everything shaded to the right. So the domain would be open or closed on the floor. Or sorry, parentheses of bracket on the floor. Bracket on the floor, all the way to infinity, but to the print. Everything from four to infinity, including the floor. For the range, this will come into play a little bit more when we actually get to 1.5 and incorporate some graphing. I will never ask you a range question where graphing won't be involved because graphing helps. When we first started the semester, I hear about we went over the parent functions. The parent graph for square root was this. And I told you it's going to look like the radical sign itself. Maybe that might jog the memory. The graph of this, and we will cover this in the next section, 1.6, 1. 1. 1. 1.5. 1.5. This picture is going to look like this. It's going to be that square root picture that is going to be shifted for the right because you can only plug in x's that start at four and go to positive infinity. So they will start right here. When you plug in four, four minus four is zero, square root of zero will be zero. That's what it will look like. So here's where I'm getting. The range. Am I getting any y value down here? No. What's the smallest y value? Zero. zero. The y value start right there at that point, which is four zero. 
the smallest y value is zero, and the rest of the y's have to be bigger than or equal to that zero. All the y values are above zero. So that means the range would be everything from zero to infinity. Those are the y's that come out. I never get a negative answer when I take a square root. I'll never get anything below the x answer unless it was shifted down below, but that's again the 1.5. Right. Every set of ordered pairs is always called A. Can be considered A. Every set, every kind of, they're all considered no matter what. Everybody's A relation. Special sets are, are called function if X doesn't repeat. If X doesn't repeat. So, how do you know X? Well, here's a visual. The visual test is called the vertical line test. Vertical line. And this is a test to see whether or not you have a picture of a function, yes or no. You take a vertical line, maybe it's your pencil, maybe it's your finger. And all you do is you drag it from left to right, across the function. If the vertical line intersects the picture in more than one place, it fails the vertical line test, and that is not a function. Okay, because right there, that is x equals a three, so right here, that looks like about three comma, I'm just guessing, 2.2. But down here, that looks like it's three comma negative uh, 0 0.7. But there is a y value, two different y values for the same x coordinate. And that will always happen if a vertical line intersects the graph more than once. If a vertical line intersects it, that vertical line has the same x coordinate no matter what. So you have one x coordinate with two different y's, not a function. So this fails the vertical line test, not a function. If I take this vertical line and drag it across, it's never intersecting the graph in one place. So therefore, this is a picture of a function. It passes the vertical line test. And that is a function. Okay, we're going. A little bit later on in chapter three, we get the horizontal line test. That's to see whether or not a function has an inverse, except actually chapter four. Probably one of the most applicable at this time of year, at this time of, uh, at this time, every four years. You're going to hear this more than we can. We actually hear too many. Inflation is increasing like it's out of control. Um, job rates are decreasing. This is increasing, decreasing. So, People are throwing these words like they have, they have enough food. Increasing is a need. Inflation, prices, uh, immigration, increasing, decreasing. Everybody's lying. And these numbers are lying because they don't think they're They're counting on it. 
Here's how you tell whether or not something's going to be. It's about reading your graph from left to right. It's always left to right. A function is decreasing. As you read the graph from left to right, the y's from one to the next, the next y is below the first one. If that's the pattern, the next x over to the right, that next y is less than the first one before. That's how we know it's decreasing. Mathematically speaking, down here, a function f is decreasing on an interval when for any x sub 1 and x sub 2 in the interval, x sub 1 less than x sub 2 implies that f of x sub 1 is greater than f of x sub 2. That's how you say it mathematically. Precisely. Not that one's bigger than the other. Going from left to right. What do you mean left to right? What do you mean bigger than the other? This is how we speak mathematically. When you, when you get to a calculus class and they're hitting you with this language, you prepare. That was the one thing I told myself when I started figuring out teaching calculus to students. I was clueless when I was in calculus classroom. I had no idea what they were yelling about out there. But my teacher was you know, kind of. So I didn't have, I didn't stand a chance, really. I didn't stand a chance in calculus until I started teaching. Then I understood it. Because I didn't want my students to end up with my experience. Language is so pre precise, the precision to it. X sub 1 less than X sub 2. That means this X sub 1 is to the left of X sub 2. We're going to the left to the right. The first X is to the left of the next X. We're always going from left to right. That's how we read that. The Y value, F of X sub 1, that Y value is above, greater than, the one after it f of x sub 2. So they're going from here to here. It's greater than that's what we need. That's what above means. Precise. That's how it, we know it's decreasing. It's increasing if it's the other way around. x sub 1 to x sub 2. This y value is less than the one that's next to it. And it's constant if all the y values across are equal to each other. That's what constant means. It's always the same number. That's not going to matter in math VA. But the precision of the language is what matters when you move along. You can't fight it. You've got to almost embrace it. Or you can cry. Okay? So you're going to have to. You can see that. I think it's a lot of things. I don't think it's a lot of The first example we're going to do, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to point it out. Number 17. So there's number 17. When you look at number 17, say, okay, what do you want me to do? And you look above and you see all this stuff. Okay, you start looking up, you scroll up. Well, wait a second. I H G L E P. What am I supposed to do? So at the, bo the bottom of the other column, who are formatted those buttons? Are the actual direct? So on Thursday, when we do this, I actually put it all in one page. We have it right side by side. We can actually see my question. 17 is one little tiny thing. Huh. Looking at the picture, we're going to figure out the domain. We're going to figure out the range. Just by looking at the picture, we want to figure out values of that. What are those points gene in language? Plugging in numbers. There's not a lot of work to do. It's can you interpret the wording into the graphic and understand what's being asked? That's it. And it's a We can do 25 right now. Oh, no, we can't. But that's increasing features. But how is this? Is this a function? No. Yeah. What about this one? 
How about this one? How about this one? How about that one? How about this one? Yes, that is a function. And then when we get to 56 and 60, remember these little piecewise functions? Your bonus question on the take home quiz. You see how there's not gonna, it's not asking you to plug something in? Sketch the graph by hand. You're going to have to graph the by hand. Now, on your test, and again, the test is not even set. On your test, your graphing will be multiple choice. Bonus question will be graphing something like this by hand. Okay. Kind of makes you feel kind of signing up all the multiple codes. Okay. So we will finish up one four and get started with one five five. So you tell me is it quiz graph one, two, or three, and then which question? One A, one B, one C, or question two, or six. Quiz graph three, one point three, number three. You want to see the bonus. I'm just gonna go like that and Tell me what you want. More things than I'm going to get all of them in front of you. It's not doing it so. On that one. So, what you see? One C. Was the name ready down? So, number one, C, we have G of X. Let me see if I understand your question. This is 1.3, uh, number three, this breath number three. This is one C. G of X is parentheses five minus, five minus X squared. And we're going to do G of two minus X. So when you say, does it matter how you write it down? You mean what the answer? No, oh, the answer. Because you got X2. It's not X2. Uh, X2 is a movie. No, I mean, uh, X, uh, uh, X to the power, yeah. X to the second or X2. Six X plus nine. And I had it the other way. I have nine or six x plus. Six. Well, the way you write a polynomial is you want to go from the highest power to the lowest power. So x squared and then x to the first and then x to the zero is the way it should be written. Okay.
Questions? So, and this comes down to that mistake I did on purpose a little while ago with the um, g of x plus h uh, minus g of x. So we're going to replace this x with the two minus x. So that x is going to get replaced with the two minus x. So it's going to be five minus x five minus x is now two minus x, and then you got to square that whole thing. And right now, I just did it wrong again because I didn't do what? Prince, it's minus that x minus that two minus x, just like that. Because now you have to do what's in the parentheses before you do the exponent, order of operation. When you make the substitution, you know, again, good habit. Parentheses, when you make that substitution, and then order of operation. So g of 2 minus x is equal to, we have a 5 minus 2 minus negative x. So negative times a negative, that's now plus x, and then squared. So g of 2 minus x is now 5 minus 2 is 3 plus x squared. And that's perfectly fine, but maybe you're going to be a little more comfortable with v of 2 minus x. 3 plus x is the same as x plus 3 squared. You don't have to. But x plus 3 to the second is more familiar than 3 plus x to the second. It's the same answer. Now we just got to multiply it out. Or when you go back to this step right here, you first should gather all your variables together. So this is equal to okay, all the x's. There's only one term with an x in it. And then gather up all the constants. A 5 and a minus 2 is a positive 3. And then square it. So either way, you still have to simplify what's inside. So you're going to square the x. Plus, you multiply the a and the b, multiply these two together. x times 3 is 3x, and then you double it. So if you have x and then times the 3 and you double it, that would be 6x in the middle. And then plus the b squared, so 3 squared is a 9. Or you just have x plus 3, x plus 3, x times x is x squared, plus 3x, plus 3x, plus 9, combine the two like terms. Let's I get it all on the day. Same destination. Make it in the box. One. Number two, find the domain. So we have H of X. is 2 minus 8x all over 12 minus 4x. 
and we'll put find the domain using interval notation. So we look at this and say, all right, either a zero in the denominator or a negative in the square root. Well, that's not a square root, but we do have a denominator. So we have to figure out what might make the denominator 12 minus 4x equals zero. So you let it equal zero, and we solve it. So when we solve this, solve for, solve for x, we're going to subtract 12 from both sides. And I have negative 4x, don't forget it's a negative, equals negative 12. Divide both sides by negative four. So X is equal to positive three. So if I try to plug in positive three, it's gonna make this denominator equal zero, which is not allowed. So X cannot be three. So the domain, X better not be a three. The number line would be an open circle on the three and everything except, and again, you don't have to do the number line thing. I'm just doing it for the visual. You have to do at the bottom of the box, right? Right, just answer using interval notation. Everything from negative infinity all the way to three, parentheses, because it's not equal to it. Union joined together with everything from three to positive infinity <coughs> from that right. What else? Yeah, one. On the first quiz prep, the function was x squared minus 4x. And when x was equal to x squared minus 12x, and on part c, we were going to plug in 2x minus 5, f of 2x minus 5. Prep number one, problem number one. C. So we're going to replace all the x's with a 2x minus 5. 2x minus 5 goes there, 2x minus 5 is going in there, and a 2x minus 5 goes there. F of two X minus five. Is equal to. So instead of X squared, it's going to be parentheses two X minus five. And that's where. And then minus 12 times X becomes minus 12 times two X minus five. Show the substitution. First step to get it right is just substitute. Now 
Now, order of operations. We have inside the parentheses, there's nothing you can simplify. 2x minus y value of the simple is going to get. Same thing there. You have to do the exponent. Okay. And here, that's multiplication. So f of 2x minus 5 is equal to, when you square this out, it's the first term you're going to square, 2x, the whole thing squared, 4x squared. Because it's minus, this is going to be subtraction, a times b. So 2x times 5 is 10x, and you double it. So 10x doubled is 20x in the middle. And then it's going to be a plus b squared, the last one squared is 5 squared, 25. So 2x minus 5 squared is 4x squared minus 20x plus 25. Now, if you're not following, then do this. It's 2x minus 5 times 2x minus 5. 4x squared minus 10x minus 10x plus 25. 4x squared minus 10x and another negative 10x is a negative 20x in the middle, and then the plus 25. And then we distribute negative 12. A negative 12 times a positive 2x. Negative times positive will be negative. 12 times 2x, 24x. Negative 12 times negative 5. Negative times a negative, that's a positive. 12 times 5 is 60. Now we gather up our like terms. All the x squared, this is the only one with an x squared, so we have 4x squared. Then the x to the first terms. We have negative 20x, another negative 24x. So negative 20x's, negative 24x's is a total of negative 44x. And then a positive 25 and a positive 60 is a positive 85. That's How do you get the negative 20x? So when I distribute 2x times negative 5 is negative 10x. Oh. Okay. Negative 5 times 2x is another negative 10x. Negative 10x and a negative 10x makes neg negative 20x in the middle. Okay. Good. Thank you. So again, we have f of x, we take squared minus 12x, and we're doing f of 5 over 3. So replace x with 5 over 3. If that x replaced with a 5 over 3, every x is replaced with 5 over 3, parentheses. 
So parentheses, 5 over 3 squared minus 12 times 5 over 3. So f of 5 thirds. Rule of excellence, when you uh, raise a rational expression or a fraction to an exponent, then the numerator and denominator each get that exponent. So 5 squared over 3 squared is 25 over 9. 5 to the second over 3 to the second is 25 over 9. Negative times a positive is going to be a negative. You can reduce this before you multiply. 3 goes into 12 four times. 4 times 5, that's minus 20. Plus 25 over 9, minus 20. So now we just have to combine those together to actually do fifth grade math and add subtract fractions. Because you're, you're not solving. You're not solving for x. You actually have to combine those together, adding subtract fractions. We need a common denominator. This is 20 over 1. So a 9 and a 1 have, what's the common denominator we're going to use? 9. So we need the denominators to be a 9. Good news, this one's good to go. Over here, to make this 1 become a 9, we multiply this one by 9 over 9. And we change it to 180. Overnight. Now we can add or subtract the fractions. And when we do that, you only add or subtract the numerator. It's the numerator 25 minus the 180 over a single nine for that common denominator. And that's how we get negative 155. Overnight, no decimals, even as a simplified fraction. And that is simple. So please remember on Thursday, you must be here in class to pick up your quiz. You cannot be picked up for you. If you're not here, come by office hours. In the middle of another class, I'll come by office hours to pick it up. Office hours are posted on the front page of Canvas. If at any time you miss class or you don't remember when something's going to happen, I always, the beginning of class will show you what's up, you know, going on with the calendar over here. So, for instance, we started up 1.4 and then on Thursday we'll continue. 1.4, we might even get some 1.5. Okay, that's where we're at. Thursday. Don't forget if you weren't here when I took roll. <laughs>